Welcome, you guys. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I am Jody Higgs and Shanda Bowie, if you want to wave as well. And Chantal is our new youth child and, child and youth care counselor, too, for the program. So she'll be providing child minding for your kids at some of the support groups coming forward as well. Um, so I want to introduce uh, PCRS, or Pacific Community Resources Society, it is a long standing non for profit agency. Um, we work right from Vancouver all the way really out to Karameas at this point in a variety of programming for children, youth, families, and individuals who have uh, sort of vulnerable lives in a variety of different ways. And we've been doing that for decades at this point. Um, so I'm really, really happy once again to have Dr. LaPointe here. And uh, she's talking today about um, a topic that comes up quite often for me, and it's one that I've spoken about um, with my caregivers for many years, and that's resilience. And how it is that some kids seem to be able to um, make the best of really unfortunate situations while others um, tend to not do so well and maybe just reach survival rather than that thriving place. Um, so I hope to learn a little bit more about how we can do that, especially for those you know, foster parents in the room who only have those kids for these sort of brief moments. Um, how can we, in those brief moments that we have with them, build a resilience in them moving forward where we don't have control um, so that they can move on to thrive and have that little bit of fight in them. So, welcome again. Thank you. Um, it used to be that when we talked about resilience, we talked about overcoming the odds. And um, we'd sort of uh, hang our hat on a star that was predefined, like if you were to overcome the odds, it meant that you landed there. And the way that we talk about resilience now is actually a little bit different. The way that we talk about resilience now involves a definition that goes a little like the following. It's not that you overcome all the odds, but rather that you meet outcomes that were better than expected. And when we go into the literature around resilience and looking at groups of people in the longer term over time and, um, and measuring their life outcomes in terms of where they landed, what kind of lives they lived, how happy they were, did they have mental health issues, did they have physical health issues, were they able to establish careers, were they able to give back to the world, I mean all of the things that we hope for in terms of the kids that were growing up. When we look at the literature around that and we look at what dictates long-term outcomes, there's one variable, one um, thing that's consistent in every single publication ever um, put into um, print and the research literature on resilience. And that one thing is that when a child has the opportunity to be loved on, by a big person who cared for them, who really understood them, when a child has that kind of an opportunity, it's about that relationship. And it doesn't matter what school they go to, it doesn't matter what neighborhood they grow up in, it doesn't matter, I mean all of the other lists of things that we get um, worried about, those pieces are not the important ones. The important ones comes down to, did you have a big person who loved on you? Now, the question, of course, becomes, does it need to be a consistent big person? And in an ideal world, yes. In an ideal world, we would want to shield children from the big breaks in attachment and the ruptures in their relationships because we know from that same literature that those breaks in attachment and those ruptures in relationship do create additional layers of vulnerability in terms of the child being able to actualize their fullest potential. However, even when the relationship can't carry on in the physical sense, there are ways for us to live on in the neurons of the children that we are caring for so that those relationships last for the rest of that child's life course regardless of whether or not you are physically present. You literally will have embedded yourselves in the neurons of their brains and you go forward with them as they grow and developing that um, resilience through that relationship because you landed in their brains. And so our plan today is to talk about um, resilience and how to awaken that in the brains and the hearts of the children that we are growing up 
um, as part of that, we necessarily have to talk about adaptation. Because adaptation is the process whereby you flex to the work around you, where you come up against the immovable brick wall and you find a way over it or around it or through it. You cannot be resilient if you are not adaptive. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that um, concept of adaptation and how we, um, we allow that to unfold in our kids. Um, and you will see that adaptation is much less about smarts here and much more about heart here. That children come into their adaptive process when they feel safe enough to do so. And it involves failure. And then it involves courage and being able to get back up and um, carry on and walk forward. We're going to talk about why that is important and how it links back to this concept of resilience. And then we're going to talk about the various things, first of all, that can get in the way of it. And then secondly, that we can be doing to set up a child's world so that we are fostering this and really um, making sure that it comes online. We will probably around 10... 30-ish, give or take, have a little bit of a break for a stretch and um, bathroom and coffee and whatever you need, so um, you can know that that's coming. Sometimes the things we cannot change are meant to change us. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so as we move into talking about resilience, we really are talking about, like, life happens. The impossible lands right in front of us. And it's out of that that we find opportunity to create growth and um, develop this concept of adaptation. And so we talked a little bit earlier about resilience. And the idea that currently how we're defining that is it's achieving better than expected outcomes. And when we look at the literature around what allows us to uh, weaken that in the children that we're growing, we see that there's really three things connected to that. And the first is where we often land, all of the risk factors, what went wrong, all of the things that have sort of derailed development and derailed life and appear to be getting in our way so that we're not able to find our way through, um, those are the risk factors. Now you can go online and look up something called the ACE scale or the adverse childhood experiences scale. It's not a protected document. Anybody anywhere can get it. And it's a list of things that um, researchers have determined to be really predictive as far as long-term outcomes in life. And so if during childhood you had one or more of these adverse childhood experiences, then your ACE score grows. And the bigger your ACE score becomes, the more likely you are to be impacted longer term in catastrophic ways that make life really challenging for you. And when we look at the um, things on the ACE list, you'll see, I mean, there's a number of different pieces, but certainly loss, significant loss, and breaks in your attachment relationships become part of your ACE score. The other thing that we know from that um, ACE score is that once you hit about four things on the ACE list. It's almost like the, the switch is flipped and you can be buried in the weight of life. Where if nothing were to be done and nothing were to be awakened in you, we can predict with very alarming accuracy what your long-term outcomes in life will be, including your physical health, including your um, uh, how long you'll live, uh, and including the kinds of successes you will likely not meet with in the longer term, with alarming accuracy. <coughs> Meaning those things, if nothing else is done for the child, predict with a high degree of certainty a life that's not going to go well. So then we have to look at, well, how do we get around that? And that's where the protective factors come into play and where the child's functioning 
comes into play. And so there's a number of protective factors, and we know things like, I did my doctoral dissertation on the neighborhood environment, so the communities that children grow up in, and what kinds of factors within those communities have trickle-down effect to actually impact child development. And certainly, there's other pieces that come into play, and we can find you know, advantages to growing up in neighborhoods where there's actual communities and parks to play in and all of those kinds of things. But the really <coughs> potent protective factor is relationship. When children have the belief that they are worthy of love and that they can count on that over time, it almost doesn't matter what their ACE score was. We're able to overcome that and their long-term outcomes, including things like how likely they are to get cancer, <coughs> it changes around all through relationships and the child's belief that they are worthy of that, right? So you can imagine, like think about even on a cellular level, that you circumvent disease when you have consistent and enduring attachment relationships. <laughs> and it's free. Love be free. <laughs> then the third piece that comes into play in terms of determining resilience is that functionality of that on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, lots of you, um, how many of you, this is your first time coming to a Vanessa workshop? Oh, yeah. How do we still first time? I know. That? It's endless. <laughs> so, those of you that have been here before have heard stories about my boys. I have two children at home, um, well, at school today, <laughs> ages 10 and almost 14 next month. Um, and my youngest son is what I would describe as an orchid child, which means that he is a highly sensitive creature. <laughs> Everything in his life needs to be just so, or the bottom falls out of it. He did, um, actually, he came by that very honestly. I think I may have given him that. <laughs> he may have got that from his mom. Um, and the thing about an orchid child is incredible <coughs> growth can happen and incredible potential can be realized. He's a remarkably bright boy, of course he is, um, <laughs> and, and the stuff that he lands on and the things that come out of his mouth and the concepts that he's able to come up with for being only 10, and he's been like that from the time he was knee high to a grasshopper, would really blow your mind, and not just because he's my kid. Anybody who gets to know him is blown away by what lives in his mind and the things that he comes up with and how hilarious he is once you get through the crusty facade and actually create a relationship with him. Now, the challenge is that when you're incredibly <laughs> sensitive and everything in life kind of gets you, you tend to be a pretty reactive human being, right? And so actually hurt my neck. <laughs> you tend to be a little bit reactive and so you're going off a lot and you're not able to sort of um, hold on to yourself in the face of how intense life is for you until your brain reaches a certain level of development. And because you have to regulate, manage your emotions around different things and deal with your stress related to that at a much higher level when you're a sensitive creature, uh, your brain actually needs to be much more developed. Now, as his mom, I will tell you that watching him wander through life and the things that he struggles with as a result of being incredibly sensitive and really overwhelmed um, have been a little heartbreaking. It's hard to watch him at times because he struggles with everything, and everything is this huge thing to him, and not because he's um, drama, 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 but because he really genuinely experiences life that way, right? And so it's overwhelming and it's big and it's huge. And admittedly, as a mother, there have been times where I've wanted to like step in front of him and all of life and shield him from all of that. And there are times when it was very appropriate for me to do so. To step in as the fierce, great mother and show the world exactly how this moment was going down, right? <laughs> and I can do that and do that very well. <laughs> However, one of the things that I really had to come to terms with and develop my own level of comfort around is that he would never 
become adaptive and thus resilient if I did not allow him to weather some of the storms of life. You have to actually taste it. You have to actually um, run into it, bang up against it, and come to terms with the things in life that aren't going to be easy for you, and that aren't going to work out for you, and that are not going to go the way that you want. You actually have to look at that to be able to adapt to it. Which means that at some point, my job as his mother is to allow him to suffer, and to allow him to hurt, and to allow him to fail, and to not abandon him in that, but to come alongside him in that, and join with him, and understand him, and have compassion for him, and allow him to find his tears, and to grieve it, so that he can summon his courage and walk forward out of it. And that's what that functioning is. And so when we look at resilience being determined by three things, one, it is about risk factors. And by virtue of the fact that I am speaking to a room of people who are fostering children, we have a, a room full of children represented by you as adults who are at risk. That is on the ACE, for sure. So without question, you are growing up vulnerable children as a result of what their histories are. And resilience is determined by protective factors, by your presence in their lives. Whether it be for a short term or a longer term, you actually live on in their neurons. You become part of the neural tract that gets laid down in their brains. And then third, that the resilience will be determined by functioning, which you awaken in the child by creating uh, for them um, this experience of adaptation and really priming that experience so that they can become uh, alive in it and um, online. So let's talk a little bit more about adaptation. So adaptation is all about being able to take multiple perspectives. And so you know when you're in the middle of something and it is not working out and it is not going the way that you wanted it to go, you need to be able to walk around it and consider that there might be an alternate view, a different perspective, another way to look at it, another way to sort of find hope and find a way through, right? And so when we can take multiple perspectives, then we become adaptive. We also know that adaptation is a little bit about perseverance. And so when people come to me and say things like, he's really stubborn, she's quite manipulative, I think, oh, that's so great. Because that means they've got a bit of gumption. And there's a little bit of fire in there. And we can take that gumption and fire and really channel that in a way that's going to work well from the adaptive um, process. And so perseverance is about sticking to it and sticking with it. And no matter how many times you run into the brick wall, finding an alternate route over, around, through, or under. Um, adaptation is also about knowing that we are taken care of. That when the child slams into the wall and bounces off and hits the ground, that somebody's going to be there. Somebody's providing a soft landing. Somebody's scooping them back up. Somebody's filling them back up so that they can feel like they've got the energy and the reserves and the gas in the tank to go at it again. And somebody is making the world around them safe enough that they're not getting drained by that world, that they have enough to kind of keep going, which was partly why there are times when, as Maxwell's mother, I should step in and say, that's not happening, or not today, or this will not go down, or you will not. Right? I step in as the great mother and I do protect and I do shield him because there are times when he needs a moment to catch his breath before he can charge back out into life again. You have a question? I have, uh, I have one of my daughter. Um, she broke six or seven, and in class they call her uh, racial names for being black. Uh, so How she old came is she? Home, six or seven? Six said. or seven. And she came home crying about these names that the kids call her in the class. And I said to her, I want you to go to the teacher and tell the teacher what they say to you and how it make you feel. She did that and she said the teacher just told her to go and sit down. So I said, okay, now I want you to go to the principal's office 
and tell her what the kids say to you and how it made you feel. So she went to the principal office and the principal dealt with it, called the, 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 the child that was calling the names in the office, called her parents, talked about the issue, and had a, uh, like an in-service training for the staff to deal with racism. And that just really empowered her so much. Mm -hmm. And I always use that strategy, you know, if they reach a big brick wall, then I do it for them, but get them to try to take the steps. Yeah. And so I don't know if you can hear at the back what the story was, but the idea is that the, the child feels empowered to know that there are going to be, at some level, there'll be somebody on her side and somebody who will see that the way that it needs to be seen so that she can continue to find her way through. I just yesterday was talking with a friend of mine whose um, son is off at a new school and he's in grade seven and he's the size of like my pinky. He's like the skinniest little uh, kid you ever met in your life. Lovely and quirky <coughs> and interesting and struggling because he's at a school that goes all the way to grade 12 and there's all these big guys in the, the locker room, in the gym change room, who are, you know, sort of creating a reign of terror in his life and um, making things really difficult for him. And so his dad had a chat with him over the weekend, and he, and he talked with him about, um, this is a week and a bit ago, he talked with him about how, he, you know, this is our reality. And he talked about when he was that grade seven boy, he was the fat kid and everybody teased him for being fat. And he had to figure out a way through all of that. And now he's got this boy who's the skinny little twerp that everybody picks on, right? And so the boy thought, hmm, I understand. And they had a big conversation about finding ways through and what that would look like. And, and maybe we don't know what the answer is, but there is an answer and we're just gonna need to be creative about it. So you know what that boy did? Without the prompting of his parents, he went that Monday to school found the um, high school gym teacher, who happens to be the coach of the senior school wrestling team, told him that when he's, he wants to join the wrestling team because he really feels like he's going to be very good at it. Imagine, he's the size of my thing. Um, but that he knows he can't join that team until grade eight, and he's only in grade seven. However, he thought if he could get a jump start on it, that it might serve him well when he gets to grade eight, that he'd be really prepared to be a really solid member of the wrestling team. And this uh, teacher picked up on it. I don't know if he knew what the boy was up to or not, but he said, you're right. You will not compete, but you will come out to every practice and you will work hard or you don't get to come. And you will be part of this team, even though you won't compete. And then next year, we'll see what happens. And so sure enough, the first week, he does nine hours, three different days, three hours a day of practice and training with the wrestling team. And you know what that has created? He's on their team now. So the dad said he went to go watch them, and they do a huddle at the end of prep. You came to his kid. There's all these little guys, you know, grade 9, 10, 11, 12 boys who are wrestlers in this skinny little kid in the middle of the huddle. But they're taking care of him and they've pulled him in and so he's found a way through yes. and now he has this sort of protection team yes. that are all around him in the locker room genius and so when children can feel empowered to find a way through but they have to bump up against their problem now our our challenge as adults is to be wise enough to know when to step in and say mm, and when to step back and allow them to be empowered that way. <laughs> and and I, my guess is for every grown up in this room, that's partly why you're here. It's like, how do you figure that out? How do you know when to give them little shoves and when to scoop them up and protect them and um, <coughs> hold them close? So part of the adaptive process is taking these multiple perspectives. Part of it is having perseverance and being able to keep on. Part of it is being able to trust in the reality that we are taking care of and so when we fall, and when we fail and when we hit the ground, there'll be somebody there to provide us up landing, to scoop us up and to fill us back up so that then we can, as children, direct our energy toward growth. You don't get to direct energy toward growth when you are locked down in the war of life, right? There has to be a container of emotional safety so that you can be um, uh, working through all of this and trusting 
that process. When you have to be mired in distrust of that process, you don't have any energy left over to grow up and mature. You're going to get stuck. And you're going to be 89 and still stuck as a 9-year-old or a 12-year-old or whatever the case might be. I, I had this little boy. Um, he had a really big, huge head. <laughs> so uh, the kids would tease him and call him a big head. It was so upsetting for him. I didn't know what to deal with it. So I said, you know why you have a big head? You got a lot of brains. And he took that. And so when he went to school and they called him names, he said, that's because I have a lot of brains. <laughs> <laughs> and see, part of it is the way that you say it. Because you're like, snap, mm -hmm. it's because you have a big brain. Right? It's like you, like it's Tuesday. They wouldn't even quit. What day is it? It's not Tuesday. It's not Wednesday. It worked yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> like it's Wednesday. Like who's going to argue with that? Nobody going to argue with that. Now the other thing is, when the world is sort of flying at kids that way and bullying and teasing and those kinds of things, um, the, the reality is sometimes we have control over some of that external stuff, right? We can go talk to a principal, we can join the wrestling team, whatever it is. We can find ways to sort of manage that. But at the end of the day, you're never going to be able to turn all of that off. It's never going to all go away. And so the conversation that I have with my children about that is, uh, so-and-so said this to me today. So-and-so hurt my feelings. So-and-so did whatever. And I say to them, what does that tell you about so-and-so? It doesn't tell us anything about you. But what does it tell us about so-and-so? Where do we know that they're coming from? What do we guess might be happening for them? Right? Because whenever somebody points a finger at somebody else, there's three fingers <laughs> pointing back at them. And so it's never about the person that they're projecting that onto. It's always about the person that it came from. And giving our children that message, this isn't about you. Whenever anybody comes flying at you with those kinds of things, it has actually nothing to do with you. It's about that person. What's going on for them that those sorts of things come out of their mouth? Because we don't have to own that. It isn't, there's nothing about us in that. It's always about the other person. Life is neither static nor unchanging. In an inherently changing world, any species unable to adapt is also doomed. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but rather the one most adaptable to change. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. And look at this one's by. You've got to have a little Dolly Parton in your resilience workshop, obviously. We cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. So the point is, resilience doesn't mean we change the reality. The reality of the children that you are growing up is what it is. You're not going to change it. I mean, which doesn't mean you're just going to throw your hands up and walk away and never be a voice for them and not go to the line and advocate for them, of course you're going to continue to do all of those things and on certain levels come to terms with your own futility in that, right? Recognizing that you too must be adaptive, very, very adaptive because you will have many, many brick walls that you'd be slamming your heads against, <laughs> right? And so coming to terms with your own adaptive process and your own futility and all of that and making sure that you have a soft landing will be part of it. What is, is what is. And so it's not that we're going to, you know, wave the magic wand and overhaul the whole system and create love, peace and harmony in all the land, but rather that we're going to take the cards that have been dealt and work it in the best possible way towards the best possible outcomes for that child. Mm. Now, for this to happen, kids need to be able um, to cycle through emotion. If you slam into the brick wall, and you'll all know the frustration of having slammed into a brick wall once or twice in your life, um, and you were to stay in that first initial feeling, what is the first initial feeling? Is anybody like right away just like soft and sad? Mm -mm. <laughs> no. 
No! <laughs> yes, that's the first initial feeling. The first initial feeling is you are not happy. You are frustrated. And you are angry. And you have big, loud <laughs> emotion. Right? And you're normal. It's supposed to be that way. Now, the problem is, what if you get stuck there? And some of you will have kids at home who are stuck there. There is nothing but the loud, the angry, the rage, the frustration, right? Now, to be able to go from there to the next level so that you can adapt, we have to be able to soften out of that somehow, right? And you'll know, um, I'll put it in the context of a very different situation, if you're grieving the death of somebody, you'll know that early in the grief process is what? <coughs> anger. And it isn't until you resolve the anger that you get to move through, you get to, did you hear my language? You get to move through to being sad. You actually, the emotion has to cycle. When emotions get stuck, that's when we get into trouble. It's when the emotion cycles and morphs and becomes something else that we're on our way. You get to move on to being sad. That's wonderful. Because it, it means that the emotion is moving and cycling through. And so we start out in the adaptive process being mad. It didn't go the way we want it. It didn't work out. It's not what we hoped for. Right? And we're mad about that. Now, it's a rhetorical question. How many of you have ever had a boss or somebody in a position of power in your life that you did not like. <laughs> and now think about that person and a time when you would have been slamming into a brick wall. <coughs> like it wasn't working and you were mad. Some task that they gave you to do or some reality that they plumped down in front of you and it wasn't what you wanted and you were really really mad but you don't like them and because you don't like them and you don't have a safe emotional relationship with them you're not gonna bring your deepest fears and your biggest tears forward to them now you might cry in front of them but you be doing the angry thing right the hot, angry tears, the ones that afterwards you're going to beat yourself up for having done in front of them because you didn't want them to know that you were even upset. That's how much you don't like them and that's how much you don't feel safe with them, right? So you're not going to get soft with them. You're not going to lament the things that haven't worked out. You're not going to own the parts of you that are scared. You're not going to go to those soft kind of places with that person, right? And the thing is, if that was a place of employment, you probably left that job. Or if you didn't leave it, you stayed on in misery out of necessity, but you sure didn't thrive. <coughs> it didn't go somewhere positive, right? And so that's the mad part. Now the next piece is that when we're in the midst of the adaptive process, you have to be able to accept the futility. The brick wall has to actually be immovable that no matter how many times you slam into it, it doesn't move, right? It becomes futile to you to try anymore. It becomes futile to you to continue to push against that, that, that you have to actually take a step back and realize it's not working. Realize that you have to stop railing against it. And it's only when you take the step back that the emotion can then move to the next place and start to soften. But if you continue at it and you get wrapped up in your mad, you're just gonna keep railing against it. You're never gonna be adaptive. You're not gonna be able to have your brain, your cortical layers that actually think for you, come back online so that you can problem solve around this. You're gonna be all regressed down in your limbic system, unable to think, unable to problem solve, unable to process, right? It's only when you move through that and come to the place of turning your mad into sad that you can wash 
through the emotion, wash it out of you, and actually bring your brain back online so you can start to think through things and problem solve. Now, did you know that when you cry hot, angry tears, they're just hot, angry tears. When you cry sad, sorrowful, soft, weeping tears, if we were to take those tears and collect them up and distill them into a solution and feed them to a small rodent, it would kill them. Yeah. It's true. Because your tears are actually taking um, the toxins from your body that are created by all of the stress that landed in your system with your mad and helping you get them out. And so they're, they're part of the process of bringing your body back down to a homeostatic sort of normal set point. And so much so that the like, crazy stuff comes out in your tears and you could kill a mouse. <laughs> Strange, but wow. Is this denial? Yeah, denial is when you're in those early stages and you haven't yet accepted that the brick wall will not move. And so you're still locked down in the stress of it and the angst of it and the upset of it. The emotion hasn't started to cycle through to sort of the softer um, emotion which qualitatively has a very different vibe to it. There was, yeah. Yeah, I just recently saw a uh, new felt and you talked about the tears of fertility and the importance of that. Um, I'm also curious about, like, a, um, the answer model theory it kind of posits the idea that we get, beca we become, um, that the endorphins and dopamine in our brain don't just work as kind of the feel good chemicals, but they actually um, work almost as a painkiller. And that when our body's in pain, or Richie anyway, he posits that, um, that endorphins are released as a way of the body coping with that pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that people who become rageaholics or people who are addicted to certain types of behaviors, cutting, are actually seeking out that endorphin release in the brain. Is mm -hmm. that, I just wondering how that kind of lines up. I'm not sure. But that was quite interesting to me because they get yeah. really stuck in that behavior. When you, when like you're suggesting they get addicted to those behaviors because I, of I, the endorphin release. Yeah, when you release. see the road rages and so forth, and I'm a counselor and I see the kids come in the office. Yeah. And, you know, try and get to, when I look at that, they, they're really holding on firmly to certain behaviors, like cutting, for example, is one that they really hold on very firmly. Um, and I just want, yeah. I just wonder if it, because, you know, you can get them to that, that place where they have their tears of utility through relationships and so forth, but yet they seem to really, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's off Yeah, I'm I not sure, know. and I'm not sure that that would be like a big enough kick that it becomes like addictive. Yeah. Um, that's interesting to me. My sense of um, like the rageaholic, for yeah. example, is that you you are not able to soften out of it, not because you're addicted to the high, but because you don't have enough emotional safety in your world. Okay. And the cutting, you aren't able to come out of it because the lack of emotional safety uh, means that you 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 can't you have to numb out to the the intensity of what you're living and feeling and if you like if you're talking to me and saying stuff to me that I just I can't hear and it's overwhelming right. it's too much right. for me yeah. I'm going to go like this <laughs> la, 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 la. and I'm going to create all this noise <laughs> so that I don't hear what's coming at me um, and so when you're cutting and you're creating all of this noise in terms of your pain sensors and other things happening in your body um, you don't you get to numb to what's happening here and so it becomes big and large um, it makes sense to me that there's the endorphin release alongside of that but I'm not sure that that's what's actually holding them stuck in those well, I'm just, yeah, I'm curious about yeah. This, this I, yeah it's interesting it's an interesting hypothesis that mm -hmm. okay, yeah thank you. I think that if I mean if you think about what it is to absolutely lack emotional safety in your life yeah. So much so that anything outside of what you're already doing is um, it's akin to death. Like you have no, you emotionally die to venture forward from where you're at. So you hold tight to uh, where you're at, and that's why we become so attached to those behaviors. They they literally are allowing us to survive. They they are giving us life. Yeah. Yeah.
I love, um, some of you will know Shafali Sabari, who um, is on Oprah all the time. She wrote the book, The Conscious Parent and the Awakened Family. Um, and she talks about, like, it's something to be locked down in, in like, the of your life. And it's something else altogether to be um, emotionally vulnerable enough that you would dare to step over the precipice and off into the gray abyss to see what awaits you in life. Because there's no given, there's no guarantee when we come out of this sort of locked down place. We don't have a guarantee that it's gonna work out. And probably it's not gonna work out several more times, <laughs> right? But that you have to be willing to step over the precipice and into the gray abyss and see what happens as you free fall. <laughs> and it's, the emotional safety of our relationships that creates sort of the net so that we don't feel like we're free falling as we step over that precipice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you. When we can move from mad to sad, that's when we get to experience what adaptation is all about. And that really is our hope for the kids that we are growing up is um, that we want them to be able to land in that adaptive place because that is the birthplace of resilience. So let's talk about what emotional safety has to do with all of that. In order to accept that which we cannot change, it means that we have to be safe to fail and safe to express the big feelings that we're going to have around all of that, right? So we have to be safe to fail and, and feel safe in getting big around our failure. In order to feel safe in that, you've uh, got two precursors. One is you have to be able to feel. Now, think about the children that you are growing up. And of course, you've seen, uh, my guess is, you've seen some upset in them. <coughs> when was the last time you saw them actually cry tears of sadness? Um. Not angry, rage, upset, frustrated tears, but soft, soft tears of sad. And if you struggle to think about the last time you saw that, you have a child who's numbed out. So they're not feeling. They may be raging and exploding and all of those things, but they're not feeling, like they're not cycling through emotion. They're locked down and shut down and in that sort of protective mode because um, that's how they keep themselves safe. They stay mired in that. It's a safe place to stay there, right? And so the first thing is that you have to be able to feel emotion. And so lots of you will start with defrosting those kids, right? And how many times, let me count the number of times, I mean, it's, it's uh, probably most of the kids that I uh, work with, at least the ones that have been in it for a while, where we begin is the defrosting process. And then what happens is the parents, the big people will come into my office and they'll say, oh my God, we've created a monster. And I'll say, what's happening? Well, they won't stop crying and this and that. And I say, oh good, we're winning, <laughs> right? Like we got a kid who's emoting now, who's feeling, whose emotions are back online. It's perfect. They become way less functional. They're actually more functional when they're locked down because it's their survival mode, right? Now they can at least take life on. And, and then when we sort of defrost all of the walls around them and they begin to be able to feel their emotions, all of their emotions, and they come back online, it gets messy. And we think, oh God, I want to go back. <laughs> Just numb them out again. But we don't want that because then we get stuck there and we aren't able to get them through the adaptive process. And so you have to be able to feel emotion, number one. And number two is you have to be able to trust that you are safe to express your emotion. That when you bleh, all of that stuff out, the people who are caring for you will capably be able to hold the space for you. They will be able to receive that and not take it personally. They will be able to receive that and not be triggered into their own upset and their own wounds and their own stuff as a result of what you, the child, are throwing out at them. 
And that as you throw that all out, you know you're not going to get in trouble for it. You know you don't get in trouble for being an emotive human being who feels and who's courageous enough to fit those feelings to the people around you. So those are all the conditions that have to be met for a child to actually even begin engaging in adaptation, the birthplace of resilience. You have to be able to feel. You have to feel safe enough to express those emotions and when you do, to know that the people you are expressing them to, your caring, safe, big people, will be able to hold the space for you and that the emotion can then land without reproach. Until we've met those conditions, there will be no adaptation and thus no resilience. And so that's where we start. We start with making sure all of that is online. When we can do that, we arrive at um, watching the process of adaptation unfold. And it looks a little bit like this. So the first thing is that the child has to experience what... and in charge. Now there's a natural hierarchy that's supposed to exist in the big person, little person relationship. Big people are in charge and little people follow along and depend on big people to have their game on and to know what they're doing and to be in charge, right? So here's the big person. We want the little person to be able to lean in and rest into the care of they're a big person. Now when a little person doesn't know that they can lean in and be safe, they're not going to lean in. They're going to go like this. And they're going to get big. Now what would create a child who cannot lean in? One thing that would create a child who cannot lean in is that they go to lean in and there's nothing to lean on. That's alpha by default. The other thing that would create a child who can't lean in is that they go to lean in and this person be so small that they, they can't quite find them. And so then they have to get big because they can't exist in the absence of somebody sort of showing them the way through. They will show themselves the way through if they can't lean in. So what is alpha by default? Alpha by default is when the big person Remember, a child goes to lean in, there ain't nobody there, so they gotta hold themselves up. So when the big person is unable to be the grown-up for the child, typically because the big person <coughs> is so stuck in all their own stuff, their guilt, their fear, their worry, their anger, their stuff. 
When the big person gets stuck there, the little person can't depend on them. And so if, I'm sure if you were to go hang out at the public health unit and watch um, kids get immunized, you would see this over and over again. You would see the big people who had sort of stepped in and were confident and capable and present and there and not like so mired in all of the angst and upset of what was happening because the child, even the little, when's your first immunization? Three months? Something like that. If the big person's doing this, the child's like, oh, you're freaked out. So now nobody in charge. Now I don't feel like I'm being held um, carefully and capably because you're you're in a panic. You're not in charge. This is not going well. Right? And so that's alpha by default compared to the adult who's there and knows that it's gonna hurt and knows what's coming and is holding the space and knowing that we're going to get through it and knowing that it's going to be okay, that's the person you lean on, right? That's the person that you lean on and go, oh, thank God, right? Compared to the other one where you're like, could you please just leave? What if the child becomes an adult by default? Tell me what you mean. They say that they become the parent because they live somehow until like, the person they're trying to lean on is, is not there for them. So they sort of save on the road. Whatever way it comes on is an adult. Yeah. And so that, that is the alpha complex. So the, the child becomes, like, when we talk about kids who've been parentified, or kids who've had to be mom to mom, or dad to dad, or mom to dad. Right? When the child takes on the role of caregiving of parent, caregiving to parent, that is alpha complex. Now the child could take on that role maybe by default, maybe by defense. Right? But it's, it, we're talking the same language, absolutely the same language. And so alpha by default, the child can't lean because there's nothing to lean on. The parent's so wrapped up in their own stuff. Right? Alpha by defense is when the parent, the big person, can't see the child for who they are. And so the world becomes too much for the child to bear. You see, I see Maxwell for who he is. And because I see him for who he is, he is not made wrong for being who he is, and he's championed along his path in life because I know what his needs are. I can, I, he can wake up and I can smell him and know what kind of day he's having, and I, and I will adjust life around him to help him through that. If Maxwell had a parent who was a suck it up, buttercup, take it on the chin, giddy up and go go, you think life's gonna wait for you? You think when you're grown up, your boss is gonna be all fine with you no. missing a day of work because you can't get yourself pulled together this morning? Right? Imagine how fried my orchid boy would be if he were being marinated in that. So fried that he would not feel seen, he would not feel known, and he wouldn't be able to trust, because, because he wasn't seen and known, he wouldn't be able to trust that he was going to be cared for in the way that he needed to be cared for. The world would become too much for him to bear if he were to just sit there, and so what will he do? He will rise up. And you thought it was hard before, having a kid who's an orchid kid and reactive? You just wait. You wait until you have a kid who's risen up and become large and in charge, and there's no way that you can be in front of them. So the alpha complex. Now, of all of the things that can happen for kids, that is the hardest one to get them to come out of. By the time a child has had to go into alpha complex, and not just kids who, you know, run into the wall and then get kind of loud about it for a bit and relax out of that, this is stuck. I can't lean on you. I can't accept your affection because I can't depend on you, right? There is, there's no energy of being able to rest in the care of your big person. Think about all of the things that start to become a problem when you can't rest in the care of your big people. Um, and when a child gets stuck there, it's, it's usually after a long period of things not having worked out. 
And so it will be a long period of being able to walk out of that with a child. And you will have to be quick and on it and smelling that and predicting and getting ahead of it and moving in front of it and calling the shots. And when they say, I want ice cream! I always feel bad when I put on really shiny voices and there's children. Do you see how you right away he was like, I just want to be. And, and you decide in that moment that ice cream's not going to be the fight that you have today. You say, no way. Guess where I was just driving to. I was going to surprise you, but now that you said that, I might as well tell you I'm already on my way to the ice cream store. <laughs> because it was your idea, wasn't it? That's what it is. It's, it's that kind of dance to get in front of and be all over and, and predict and meet and, and invite enough rest in the relationship that they can do this. It takes a lot. Yeah. You have to have stamina <coughs> to be a big person who walks a child out of alpha complex. Totally possible. Totally conquerable. Totally doable. Completely challenging. The most challenging thing to walk a child out of. And a lot of you will have kids in alpha complex. Another thing that can get in the way is the very sensitive child. <coughs> so think about the child, like Maxwell, who's sensitive. What makes children sensitive? Anybody have any ideas? Fear. So one reason that you could become sensitive has to do with fear. If you have been sensitized to know that you will survive if you are highly attuned to and vigilant to all of the things happening around you. If you're alert and you're on and you're sensing and you're detecting and you're noting and you're observing all the time, then you might have a chance at keeping yourself safe. That would create sensitivity in a child. The environment that they're being marinated in being one of fear. If you're marinated in fear, you become hypervigilant, hypersensitive, right? There are also other things that can happen. When a child um, is born, if things around the delivery process are not smooth, so that the <coughs> child doesn't get sort of the natural experience of being born, because there's hormones that get released into the mother's um, blood system that become part of what the child experiences during birth. There's pressure that um, gets placed onto the brain as it moves down the birth canal. And that pressure is actually important as part of the birth process and what's happening neurologically. And so children who have um, traumatic births, children who have um, precipitous births that go really quickly, um, other things that go sideways uh, in the birth process, it becomes very lengthy, all of that kind of stuff. When there's challenges, significant challenges in the birth process, there's a part of the brain that doesn't get to suck in and suck down and take hold like it otherwise would. It's called the reticular activating formation, or the RAF, and your reticular activating formation serves the job of being the net that keeps information out that is not relevant and allows information through that is. If your reticular activating formation isn't working, everything's getting through. Everything is landing. Everything is getting you. Right? And so you're, you become a sensitive child um, by default. And some kids are just kind of wired that way. They just come out like that. They're just sensitive kids. And so when you're sensitive, it's like you have a nervous system with no skin on it. There's nothing protecting you. Everything gets you. And it might be that everything gets you emotionally and you're really affected by all of that. Somebody <coughs> can look at you in a certain way and it just like sends you off course for the rest of the day. It might be that you're really sensitive um, sensorially. So lights bother you, and sounds bother you, and temperatures bother you, and internal states bother you. I, if you've had kids who, like, they'll be, you'll be driving along, especially in the wintertime when they have their, their warm coats on in the car, and then all of a sudden they're tearing their clothes off because they just can't stand how hot they all of a sudden realize they are. Or kids who get hangry, where they get, they're hungry, and they're hungry, and they're hungry, and they haven't really alerted to the internal sensation, and then all of a sudden, bam! And they can't even handle life because they're so hungry. Oh, 
um, for those kids, life is hard. The climb can get very steep, and if they happen to be in an environment that's not flexing to them and or around big people who aren't capably stepping in and shielding at times when it would be appropriate, um, life is just overwhelming because you're sensitive. That's my maximum. The child for whom no boundaries are defined. Yes. <clears throat> so in order to know adaptation, you actually have to experience it, which means there has to be walls that do not move. You have to smack your head into them. You have to come face to face with the reality of futility. And to do that, you've got to have the adult that can hold onto your big feelings for you. And often what happens, adults have given up on themselves and or given up on the child. And so they can't, they're like, oh my God, I cannot take another meltdown. I cannot take the fuss. I cannot take the upset. I can't handle it. You want cookies for dinner? Carry on. You don't want to go to school today? Carry on. You don't want to share with your sibling? Carry on. You want to play video games for 14 hours today? Carry on. Right? Because... <clears throat> It's too much of a fight. Now the truth is, sometimes we're calling it. If we're in it in the early days with a child, and we don't really have relationship established as a context from which to find our power in order to really capably parent that child, and we know we're sort of in it for the long haul and things are going to be a little difficult for a little while, are you really dying on the molehill of A, B, C, or X, Y, Z? You're not, because if you're constantly in it and defining boundaries over and over and over again for that child, smacking their head into the brick wall over and over and over again, how's your relationship going to go? Probably not well, <laughs> right? And, and for a lot of kids, you're not going to be starting in neutral. You're starting down in a big old hole. And so if you want to build relationship, you are going to have to let go of a lot of expectations and boundaries that you might later on introduce and define. So early on, your expectations and boundaries, if you're early on in relationship with a child who's struggling, your expectations and boundaries have probably been reduced down to safety. We wear our seatbelts, that's the law. We don't go out at midnight because we don't do that but you don't want to eat your broccoli and all you want is chicken nuggets for the next seven weeks, carry on, right? You want to play four hours of video games today instead of the rule of two or whatever it is, carry on, because I'm not dying on that mole today. You're not telling the child that, obviously, <laughs> right? You're declaring it. Oh yes, that's what I thought, it'll be four hours today, right? Because. If you create too much conflict in a relationship that has not yet developed, you will never get the relationship. And if you don't have the relationship, you never get to the point where you get to define the boundaries, create a container emotionally to hold the child, and allow them to move through the adaptive process. So don't, don't, like, don't run away too far with the idea that we need to define boundaries. We do in the context of relationship. And you don't develop relationship when you're at war with a child all the time. Um, so if adults are fearfully backing off and giving up in enduring kinds of ways, then the child doesn't get to experience the immovable wall. In order to adapt, you have to be able to experience that. Another thing that can get in the way is the child who is drowning in the face of things that are unchangeable or challenging. So what that might be, it could be situational factors that are unchangeable or challenging, environmental factors, trauma, loss, developmental exceptionalities, children who are born uh, with FASD or um, other kinds of developmental things, but it can be changed. You know what? The world wasn't made for them. The world is awful to them. And it's difficult and it's an uphill climb and people aren't always understanding and kind. And so there's a lot that can be experienced that's overwhelming when you have a developmental exceptionality and then other big life changes that happen um, that can be really hard for kids. They get overwhelmed, it's too much. Do you think you let your brain blow about in a world that's completely unsafe to you emotionally? No, you don't. You get maladaptively smart, right. and you close the doors so that you don't have to feel. And what do we know is one of the essential components of the adaptive process? 
You must be able to feel. If you've closed the doors and numbed out, you're not going to be able to be adaptive. And one of the things that can get you there if you are drowning in the unchangeable or that which is challenging. What about the child whose brain has already gone there and is protecting them from feeling? Some of you may have children who came onto the scene already in that state. If you can't feel, as Gordon Newfield says, you're numbed out and you're tuned out, and you don't believe that you can come to rest ever, you're just going to numb out. You're going to exist in that state. You've probably been diagnosed with ADHD. You're probably on a stimulant medication that really isn't working. Uh, and you probably will see that those children, their functionality um, is even further reduced the more that's going on around them. If they're, if they're kids whose functionality um, increases the more that's going on around them, they're probably um, not numbed out. So if you have a child whose brain is turned off already, they're not adapting. And we need to know that you might have a child who's somewhat adaptive this afternoon at 3 p.m., who is not adaptive tonight at 9 p.m. And you might have a child who was adaptive all of the last three weeks, but then something happened Saturday afternoon, and they're no longer in an adaptive kind of way. And so then you retreat, and you go back. And you fill in and you fill up and then you press <coughs> forward again. So know that it's a shifting kind of entity and that the child, as long as their attachment um, needs are being met, they will continue to move forward even when they have setbacks. And all of you, by the way, you flow in and out of your adaptive state as well, depending on your life stressors and the other things that are happening uh, for you. The biggest thing to know is that behind all of the challenges that children are experiencing is all of this stuff. And if we forget that the meltdowns and everything else are coming forward from the adaptive process, if we are just like, oh my god, this kid, so challenging, all of these behaviors, all of this fallout, all of these things, if we get stuck there and like, really, that's what, you do that because that's what I said. This is your life. We can't change this life, right? We get stuck there. We forget that this is here. And so if you have a child who's melting down a lot, who's acting out a lot, who's acting in a lot, self-loathing and self-harming and those kinds of things, if you have a child who's defiant, if you have a child who's oppositional, if you have a child who's any of those things, you have to know that behind the black box lives the adaptive process. So if you have a child who's stuck there, the answer, in terms of getting through it, is to go here. And you back it up. You melt them so their feelings are able to come back online. And when you do that, you finally get to be at the place where you find a way through. So how do we find a way through? And we're going to talk through. Um, a few different things uh, in terms of that so that by the time you leave today you have a sense of what it is to be the kind of big person that awakens resilience in a child. So the first thing in terms of finding a way through is to be the kind of big person who is in charge. Large and in charge. But not in a scary kind of way. In a loving, capable, certain kind of way that you step into the lead, that you take the steering wheel of life, and that you make sure it's you who's in the driver's seat. And that every time the child looks, you're still there. And every time the child tries to climb over and sit in the driver's seat, you're nudging them back to the passenger seat if they're an adolescent, or the back seat if they're a younger child. Right? So kids need to have the feeling that the big person is in charge, and it's not the kind of big person who's who's blinking, flashing lights in charge, right? That's yucky. It's not safe. That's more force rather than power. You want to come at your in-chargeness through a position of power. And power comes from relationship. When children like you, when children feel safe around you, they will desire to do your bidding and not before. 
until that point, in fact, they'll be full of resistance. You want to, I remember um, a man that I used to work with, he, he said that you walk softly and carry a big stick. <laughs> Don't take that one early. <laughs> but it's the idea that you're not like, check me, and I'm in charge, and this way sad, and look what I did for you, and da 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 Right? You want to be the kind of big person who's stepping forward, who has that energy, who's shoulders are back and whose chin is up and whose eyes are finding their eyes. And it doesn't mean that you're always sunshine and roses and soft and sweet, right? There might be a time when that's your voice. And I've got you, we're okay. Because that's my meaning business voice. That's how you know that what I just said, I really meant, right? And I love you, and I understand you, and I see your frustration. Okay? So be in charge, which does not mean be mean, it mean which is force. Be in charge. Be full of power, and come at your power through the relationship that you have with the child. Know that children need us to be bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind. And so... The way that we invite children to grow, the way that we invite children to develop and to become independent is that we actually encourage them to be fully dependent. It is out of the gift of complete dependence, the gift of complete dependence, that children will desire to surge forward in life. Think about resilience from that perspective. A child doesn't have the capacity flowing out of them, desiring to attack life and take it on, and, and grab on and hold on and um, be part of life. They don't have that desire if they haven't been able to rest, right? It's only when they're able to rest and trust that and like snuggle into that relationship that they can summon it, that it'll start to kind of brew in them and percolate in them and bubble up out of them and become part of this effervescence that they will um, manifest in the way they live their lives. And so we want children to have that sort of going forth kind of energy. We've got to fill them up. We've got to allow them to rest into our care. And we must know that, yes, you should. Do for a child what they can and should do for themselves. Yes, you should. Allow them, invite them, create for them a reality of, independent, of dependence so they can become independent. You don't get to independence by forcing it on a child. No human being ever became truly independent in the truest definition of the word independence. No human being ever became truly independent, truly mature, by being forced into that position. That just perpetuates immaturity and dependence in a way that never allows you to adapt and awaken your internal resilience. Be all-knowing when things do not work out or go as planned. So when we invite children to slam into the brick wall, over and over and over again, what do we expect will happen? It won't move. Which means they're going to fall on their faces. And they're going to fail. And they're going to be frustrated. And it's going to hurt. And it's not going to go the way that they intended. And when all of that is happening, if you're like, oh man, sorry about that. Shoot. Uh, I really, I really thought that that was going to sort out. Too bad. If they're like, really, you had no idea? <laughs> really, you had no idea? You get in charge of it. The way you stay big when all of this is failing and not working out for the child is you own it. You be omnipotent. Of course you fell down. Of course you're frustrated and full of shouts and rage today. I knew that you would need that. That's okay. You just, it's like you, you 
you called the shots. You know, you were like, guess what? Check it. I'm already driving to the ice cream store. You do the same thing here. Guess what? Check it. Of course you, you had to do that. Of course that had to happen. Of course that will go that way. I had a boy in my office just last week where he had engaged in a behavior at school that didn't work out well for him. And, and it wasn't the first time. And he is full of shame and self-loathing. He has um, a developmental exceptionality as FAS. And so he struggles with impulsivity and all of these other things. And he just is like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I can't avoid these things. Why do I keep doing this stuff? And he was really, really locked down. And, and there was such release for him in knowing, like, of course that happened. Of course you had to do that again. That's going to be part of how you grow. And guess what? You don't get to grow unless these things go sideways sometimes. And you know what? Nothing in terms of how I feel about you or what I think about you has changed between five minutes ago when I didn't know about, about what happened and now. Nothing's changed for me. And this will happen again. There's probably going to be another time. I'm going to guess maybe even in the next month where something like this goes down again. And I'm going to know you didn't mean it. And I'm going to know you didn't want that. And I'm going to know that this is part of how you're growing. And I'm going to be so happy to hear about it, because then it means I get to be alongside you and helping you grow through it. There's no shame in this. There's no worry in this. Now, you remember what the expectation is, right? Of course you do. Of course you know that this is not allowed, and of course you know that this is what you're, you're supposed to be doing. And of course I know that you're going to do your very best to make sure that you deliver on that. And you'll fail. And that'll be okay. Um, yeah, just underlining what you're saying, you're so right about you. Like, language is so important. You know, um, when I kid comes in and tells me their story, they tell me their story and yeah, hear how they did come. That's the first thing I, I do is validate that, of course, you're feeling that way. How could you not? If you weren't feeling that way, you're not take, paying attention to your own life. Um, and it's amazing the response from that when, when I just validate that, of course, you're feeling that way. They just like, oh, oh, so you kind of get me. Um, but isn't language like so, so, so important in terms of yeah. what the unspoken messages that sometimes parents and teachers can give to, to the kids? Like, I'm coming from a school perspective where kids. Um, you know, unfortunately in classes their adaptive behavior can be, you know, I'm feeling a little anxious, I don't want to take this test, and then they think they never, you know, I had one parent that didn't, didn't make their daughter go to school for four years because she had a bad day, and, you know, I'm trying to explain to them that, you know, um, on some levels when you say you don't have to go back there, honey, you're kind of saying, you know, I don't think you can help it. You right. know, I, instead of, I know you've got this, I know it's going to be difficult, it's, I'm, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to handle that, so you don't have to go. Right. And that, that lack of um, confidence and faith in the child can, yeah. can, can translate into very unhappiness. And the lack of confidence and faith in the child. It's just a lack of this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and also the energy in the grown-up from which that right. comes forward. And so, um, so my son Maxwell, <coughs> we moved him to a new school this September. That's um, a, a, it's a private school designed for kids that have learning differences like his. Um, and and we tried another school for five full years of not greatness, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so the move, um, the energy behind it, so that Maxwell could con like hit his stride and continue to grow and develop, and he's had to awaken within himself a lot of resilience along the way. The energy behind that school move couldn't be like, this was too hard, you failed, we're so worried about you, we're going to put you somewhere that it's an easy ride. And even if I didn't speak those words, if I believed that, he would know it. Absolutely. Because there would be the unspoken messaging right. behind what was so being important. said. Yeah. It's so important. And so the big thing was to clean up this first, to make sure that my intent around moving him was to awaken 
his potential, not rescue him from a not great circumstance, right? And so when my intent is to awaken potential, then the way I emote, the way I talk, my, the energy in the field around me is going to be a child who's like, look at me. Look at me at the top of my class. Look at me being a math whiz, <laughs> right? He gets to experience those things because he was uh, invited to see his potential rather than like, oh, they're there. You can't, you can't handle it. It's all about energy it is. and the unspoken huge. messaging huge. of that. Energy is huge. Yeah. Energy is huge. So be all knowing when things do not um, go as planned. Of course that happened. Of course you need to yell, shout, cry, scream, <coughs> right? Go ahead and, well, I don't know, call me every horrible name in the book that you can think of. You, you go right ahead. Of course you have that in you today. It could be no other way. This is exactly what needed to happen. And they'll be like, wow, <laughs> you really do know me, <laughs> right? Um, so you walk alongside, and the point is, that that's inevitable. Slamming into the brick wall, being mad so you get the chance to then become sad, it's inevitable. And the more you're like, stop it, stop it, don't, you just look incompetent. And so if you call it, and because it's gonna happen anyways, guys. So call it and own it and welcome it and invite it and create space all around that, it will help you along your way. Plan for transitions, change, and the things that are difficult. Why would we want to do that? <laughs> Why do we want predictability for a child? So they can really lean in and rest into your care. If they're constantly worried about the rug being pulled out from underneath them, there is no rest in that for them. That's why transitions are so hard for kids who are mired in the muck of life that's become too overwhelming and challenging. They don't transition well because it's a completely alarming experience for them. So if you call it and you say, there will be an assembly this morning at school, which means you will leave math class early. How many of you have had kids who freak out their whole day is put off by an assembly? <laughs> I know. It's so overwhelming to them because it's an unexpected transition, an unexpected change in schedule. And of course you're not going to be able to call the shots in all of this and plan around all of this. There'll be things that come up and fall from the sky and then we, you know, we go back to here, pardon me, to here. Um, and we be able, of course, of course that, you know, you would have lots of upset when the assembly came and you didn't know. I get that. I understand that. It had to be that way, didn't it? Right? And so when we can, um, plan for all of that, we invite them to rest into our care more capably. When we are unable to plan, then we go back to honoring the fallout from that because of course there will be fallout. How do you plan? Well, have routines. Have rhythm to your day. Have a way of doing life. Have a way that Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays look. Have some rhythm. Have some routine. If you have parts of your day that are particularly challenging, getting out of the house in the morning, surviving the coming home from school and getting to dinner time routine, getting into bed at nighttime. If you have really tricky parts of your day, take those parts of the day and visually script them for the child. And it might look a little something like this, so you can come up with any kind of visual script that's gonna work for you. <laughs> Usually you have to make it visual so that there's pictures involved. You don't always have to make it visual. Um, for kids that are really, really capable readers, you might just be able to get away with writing down words in a list, right? Um, but there are ways to script out the challenging parts of the day. I've actually had families where that is the only intervention. The only intervention is to visually script and create routine and rhythm. That's it. One of the, the most impactful families that I can think of where that worked incredibly well, we had a really, really serious um, safety situation where an older sibling had um, very horrifically harmed a younger sibling. And so there was an urgency behind the reaction. And I remember communicating at that time to my team leader that my plan was to visually script. And he was like, say what? <laughs> that's the intervention? Yeah, because that's a super depressed mom who, who hasn't been able to because she's so stuck in what's going on inside of her 
for many, many very good reasons. There is no rhythm. And this is a kid who's really sensitive and overwhelmed by life and needs the rhythm in order to feel safe enough to exist. And without that safety, becomes incredibly dysregulated and then not great things are happening, right? So we create the safety, how? We visually scripted the entire day, which took a lot, by the way. Um, and uh, within five days, I went back to the home and checked in around what was happening. And she, she said, like, I don't even know who he is. The change was that significant in the child, where he was just like, oh, someone's in charge, <laughs> right? Like, so relieved that there was a sense and a direction and a rhythm and a routine uh, in terms of life. <coughs> Another piece in terms of finding a way through is um, creating some hope in advance, because lots of kids will feel backed into a corner. They'll feel like they've ruined it. They'll feel like all hope is lost. They'll feel like there's no way through and then you thought it was um, hard and that they were reactive and difficult before then. Wait until they throw the towel in. Wait until they decide it's not worth it. Wait until they decide they're not worth it. Wait until they decide that they've already messed it up with you. Time to, to really giddy up and give her so they can get on to the next family. You thought it was bad before then, you didn't see nothing yet. So what if you erased that point? What if you said, you know what, this is going to be hard. You know what, we're, we're doing something, we're in something, we're about to go somewhere, whatever it is, and you just call it, it's going to be hard. And because it's going to be hard, you might have some big emotions and big blowout about that, and that's okay. I want you to know there's nothing you could say or do or be that I won't be able to handle. Nothing. So whatever it is, you bring it. Because I've got you. And I've got this. Right? And then you just erase it so that they don't have to feel like they have to give her. Right? That's hope in advance. The other piece is there's going to need to be lots of space and room for do-overs. When kids feel like there are absolutes as far as their performance is concerned, which by the way may not have anything to do with you, that there's the sense of the absolute in terms of performance. It's created by the world around, usually in terms of a lot of the not great feedback that they've received along the way. When they feel like there are absolutes in that, they just, they, why even bother? Why would I even start? Why would I even try? Why would I even begin? And we get locked down there. And so that, of course, of course this didn't go our way. And of course it didn't work out. And we're, we're going to have another go at it. We're going to rest for a little bit right now. And we'll come back at this another time. Don't you worry. There'll be other chances. We're done for today. But there'll be some other chances. You'll see. Right? Where you can just be full of confidence and encouragement around all of that. As part of all of this, do not rely on reason and teaching. We don't teach children how to adapt. We don't explain with words and language. Your life is hard. You're going to need to figure this out. You have to, you have to awaken your drive to survive. We don't, no child in the history of time ever became resilient because somebody taught them that. Children become resilient when they live this, when they experience it. You can't teach it. It's not a teachable subject. It's life. It's in the living of it that it becomes real. So if you find that you're doing a lot of talk, talk, talking at kids about all of these things, you're on the wrong track. And you're probably <coughs> doing that because you're freaked out that you don't have it going on for them. Check in there first. Clean that up. Find your confidence and then go out and live it alongside them so they get to immerse in that and experience that. Which brings us very um, nicely to the next place of you need to be able to regulate yourself if you're going to be able to awaken this in a child. So if you find as an adult that you are constantly up in your own business, as an adult that you're reactive, as an adult that when this child, whatever, they're looking into the space between you and them, that you're getting going, and you take personal offense to it, you think it's about you. And so you get angry and agitated and frustrated 
And you get worried that the world around you is going to shame you and judge you because you've got a kid and your care is behaving so horribly. When you got that program going on and it comes down to energy, you, you have no idea how impossible it's all going to be out here. This has to be clean. This has to be sorted. You have to regulate. If a child says something awful to you and you feel yourself go, how dare you? <laughs> Even if you don't say it, you feel it or you feel yourself go, you little bleep, 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 bleep. Do you know what I have done for you? Do you know what I get? This is not the child's stuff. That's you. That's your stuff. That's your wound. That's the parts of you that you have not yet grown up. And do not fool yourselves into thinking that you can grow up children in the best possible way when you haven't first grown yourselves up. So you have to be able to climb inside. And you have to be able to find those parts of you that are getting all fired up and tripped up in the raising up of this child, because that's not the child's business. That's your business. You regulate that and you create the energy around you that will allow that child to experience, not be taught, but experience what it is to be regulated themselves. And out of all of that, they're able to feel, they're able to emote, they're able to cycle through, and they're able to grow. Go. I used to, I used to have a time out room for myself. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> so when I get to that point, I have the time out. So once I'm in this time out room, but there's this particular kid who would come and knock, and he would call me mom. He's a teenager. Um, mom, do you like a cup of tea? No, Sam, I do not need a cup of tea. I need to be alone. But he would bring the cup of tea anyways and bring it. And then he would bring his music box and put it on and put some music on for me. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, but it helps me because, you know, then I lighten up and. <laughs> okay, it was so funny. When, as adults, you feel like you need to exit a situation before you pull over the child, exit the situation in a way that has them resting into your care. And I call it the graceful exit stage left, where you're like, oh my god, I was supposed to phone grandma. I'll be right back. BRB. <laughs> right? Because then the child doesn't feel like they have to take care of you. We want them to, to be able to rest in your care, not feel like they have to care for you, right? And so it's all, and it, again, it all comes down to energy, right? It comes down to the energy around it and how you create that, that the child's gonna be able to um, rest into that. And the final um, piece is around getting your comfort on. You wanna make sure that when children are feeling their big emotions, as they will do as part of the adaptive um, process, you can't get through it without the mess of the big emotions that you are full of connection and comfort, that you, um, you draw them to you rather than send them from you when they're frustrated, that you create sort of all sorts of space and invitation for all of that to exist, that you empathize, you be soft, you nurture, you pick up what they put down, and then you have them know that. How will they know that you've picked up what they've put down? Because they see you then move and recalibrate and adjust on their behalf as a result of picking up what they put down. You get that it was too hard. You get that the ask was too big. You get that whatever that circumstance is was too much. And you move swiftly and fiercely to adjust it in the wise way that you know in terms of being able to push and being able to scoop up um, and hold. Uh, so you want to, them to know that you are the one who gets it. So where does that bring us to? Children? need to be adaptive. In the world of challenges, big people have a huge and central role to play in facilitating this to promote resilience, which is better than expected outcomes. The conditions of emotional safety and relational <coughs> connection must be met for adaptation to unfold. You will need intuition and the resultant wisdom to know how to prime that process, when to push and when to protect, and take faith that a gentle and consistent approach goes a long way toward cultivating deep roots and lasting change, even if you only get six months, or 12 months, or two years. 
it actually soaks in through the system and up into the neurons and becomes part of that child's physical, cellular makeup, which will stay with them for the rest of their lives. And so you might not get to see the ultimate final ripple effect of what you started, of the drop that you created, but you have to take faith that there is a ripple effect. And it'll play out in whatever way it needed to play out. And you will live on in that child's neurons. We've got about four minutes for some questions and then we'll be wrapped up for the day. Go ahead. I, uh, I just got a, a, one of my teens, a yeah. heavy duty teen. Um, I've had her for five years. She just aged out and just moved, didn't move far, moved in with my granddaughter because like, I'm not moving home. But I found with her, it was addiction. I'm a recovery person for 24 years. I was able to share my experience, strength, and hope with her without. And I mean, she just took it to your cake. She's 19, clean wow. and sober. Mm -hmm. But for her, she said it was about when she did an act, she came up with the consequence. Okay, what does this look like for you? What solution can you come up with? And what should your consequence be? And we did the mirroring too, because she's like, oh, I don't think you heard me. So I go, you want me to repeat? So I repeat it. And she go, no, that's not what I meant. She'd redo it. And you know, and as a result, she's going to do social working and working with use in mm -hmm. addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was three years, I got me in cops, it was awful. But it was pushing through that right. and allowing her to fall. But she knew, like she'd phone and go, these kids are after me with machetes. I was in that car, man. I had the machetes, the pepper spray, and her in the car. I wouldn't mess with you, I can already tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's me. So right off the bat, she, like she said, I'll never forget. I always felt I was there. Ah. Uh -huh. So exactly. I'll never forget. I always felt I, that you were there. Right? That she could lean in, that she was going to be provided for, that she was going to be taken care of, that you were going to keep her safe, that you were going to make sure whatever her need was, there was an answer to that somewhere, somehow. Come, hell or high water. A solution to every problem. Right. In the faith. So now she gets to be a grown up, doesn't she? Now she gets to live because she got to rest into that and probably quite literally gets to live because she got to rest into that. And can know within herself a sense of confidence and capability that came out of resting into your confidence and your capability. She can give that to herself now because she got that from a big person who loved on her. That's, and I believe that's, for me, that's my part, right, is to be able to do this. Yes. If I can't, I let them know, I'm not sure, I'll make a couple of calls for you. Yeah. I, love I don't have all the answers. You are an answer, and that's the difference. You don't need to know them all. You need to be an answer. You need to be the answer. I have room for, or time for one last time I have a question. All right. No, I just, you go ahead. I, I have to, I've got a 12 o'clock at my office, so I'm going to be jamming. Okay, you can go. Thank you guys very, very much for being here. One of the things that I love the most when I look around the room is all the head nods. Yeah. <laughs> Constant, like that affirmation and validation that the fingers say. I think it just hits all of us and it's at different points, and, but it, it does touch it. Um, so we're not going to see you until February again. Ah, we're going to see you withdrawal. Dr. Jill in January. <laughs> Who um, you will love. She is one of um, the nation's experts in terms of mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness, creating space between 
what is happening and what your reaction is going to be. It's that space in between. And in particular, where she comes at it is mindfulness in the act of caregiving, in the act of parenting. But checking in with ourselves that checking you talk in so with much ourselves. about yourself. That's right. Where you are. Um, I don't know if you're able to bring a few of your books with you when sure you come can. back in February. Yeah. I've had a number of people yeah. ask, and I think if they were here, they're 20 bucks each, and if you had a couple here, you might actually sell it. Absolutely. <laughs> I left at the front. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. I've also left um, pamphlets for Dr. LaPointe's Wishing Star Clinic as well as um, for Shanda and my program here as well. And we may not be in this space in January, so really pay attention to your emails. Okay? We'd like to find a community-based space where we could have child minding available um, and where we're not always as concerned with the with the sense and the fragrance thing going on. And, um, and the space is moving anyway. We're actually moving into a new space um, at 104th well, Kitty Corner. So we have moves coming up. So pay attention to emails in terms of addresses. But we will be back on in January and maybe in this space. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.